When we look at Olympic sport, sport at the highest level, there are clearly some athletes who always seem to get it right. For example, Usain Bolt, Olympic 100 meter, 200 meter champion, twice over in the 2008 Beijing Olympics and in the London Olympics. Michael Phelps, the most bemedaled Olympian of all time. These are athletes who clearly get it right, both psychologically and physiologically all of the time. It's also interesting to note that they have contrasting approaches. Usain Bolt with all his comedy antics prior to his event when he's on the start line. We've all seen this. Okay. Um, Michael Phelps, however, a much different approach. He sits down, he has, he's listening to music, he has a much more cerebral, contemplative approach towards his event. But it's both very effective. Sports psychology may play a part in their preparation for their events and may be a reason why they're successful. What happens when things go wrong? Here's another example. In the 2012 Olympics in London, in the soccer final, there were two finalists, Brazil and Mexico. Brazil were the undoubted favorites. They were expected to win. They were the reigning Olympic champions. They were extremely skilled. On paper, they were the best team. Mexico had made it to the final playing well, but they were unfancied. In the final, Mexico went at Brazil in an incredible display of attacking football. It was incredibly impressive to watch. And if you watch the Brazil players, their heads dropped. They seemed slightly defeated. They couldn't understand why they weren't performing as well as they, they were. Perhaps they were complacent. Perhaps they had uh, expected too much. Perhaps they were overconfident. The Mexicans had nothing to lose. They attacked with fervor and they, they won the Olympic title. They were the Olympic champions over the fancied favorites. Perhaps sports psychology can explain why uh, fancied champions may be overconfident and may fail when, when they're expected to win. And perhaps why underdogs take on the best and win despite all the odds. Take another example. James Magnuson, a man with seemingly unshakable self-confidence. He said he was going to win the 100 meters sprint final in the pool at the London Olympics. He was extremely confident. But in that race, he was outtouched on the line by Nathan Adrian by one one hundredth of a second. And that was devastating for him. You could see his body language after. He was destroyed. Perhaps he was overconfident. Perhaps, though, his, over, his confidence in, in, the, in, the, in the events leading up to the, to the actual final, perhaps his confidence belied an underlying self, self, uh, low confidence. Perhaps he was, wasn't very confident inside when he should have been uh, supremely confident of his abilities because he was the, the, the world leader in the event. So perhaps psychology may have played a part, but in particular, it may help when, it, when overcoming such a devastating defeat for the next event. Another very good example, Rory McIlroy in the 2011 Augusta Masters, he was expected to win. He was amongst the favorites, certainly. And he's an extremely talented golfer. In fact, he's the, he's the one, one player that all of the people on the tour, all of the golfers on the tour, the PGA Tour, fear the most. And yet, on the day when he was leading, on the final day of the event, he was leading by four shots. He would played superbly on the previous three days. He experienced a catastrophic drop in his performance. He shot a round of 80. And this is something that... Uh, professional golfers can do in their sleep, certainly very easily, um, because they, they frequently shoot rounds of, of 70 or below, and that's a, that's a, good, a good shot. So, so 80 was a catastrophic failure, and he ended up tying for 15th place. So you'd think that that sort of devastating performance may have impacted on his, on his mind. However, for only eight weeks later, he won the US Open, and there was no sign of the lack of confidence and the, the fact that the pressure had got to him that was de displayed when he was in Augusta. So it seemed that he picked up the pieces. And what is it that made him do so? Sports psychology may indeed have the answers. So elite athletes, coaches, and the people who surround athletes know very well the importance of sports psychology, and they're beginning to embrace it. Sports psychologists are often included in the teams that surround athletes nowadays. What is sports psychology? Well, it's the the science of and, and the study and practice of mental preparation for sport. 
It involves identifying the techniques and strategies that athletes can take and use so that they perform at their most optimum. It also helps athletes deal with, comeback, with setbacks and help them to come back from devastating defeats, defeats such as those by James Magnuson or Rory McIlroy. So we'll just begin to unpack some of these strategies that sports psychologists talk about. So looking inside the mind of a winner, what factors are linked to success in sport? Well, clearly an athlete has to be motivated. Often goals that, mo that athletes set describe or um, will demonstrate how, m how much effort and how much will they have to win in their event. But sometimes motivation isn't, just en isn't enough. An athlete has to be confident. And confidence seems to be ubiquitous amongst high-performing performers. There are a number of strategies that athletes can use to boost their confidence. Another important factor is knowledge of the sport. So basically knowing your sport inside out, but also knowing the opposition. What are their strengths and their weaknesses? One of the phrases coined by um, Clive Woodward, who was the England's coach at the time they won the Rugby World Cup in 2003, one of the phrases he coined was total rugby, leaving no stone unturned when it comes to performance. He was very famous for developing Dossier, dossiers on the opposition, knowing their strengths, knowing their weaknesses, and where he could attack them, and how he could tactically outwit them. And that's clearly important uh, in sport these days, so using psychology to understand the opposition as well as yourself. Athletes are also very good at using routines, getting themselves in the right frame of mind, and we'll look at that in a few moments' time. Athletes are also good at handling pressure. If you look at Usain Bolt and Michael Phelps, they are cases in point. And anxiety management is clearly an important aspect of uh, an athlete's arsenal of strategies to get them in the right frame of mind so that they can perform at their best. So let's look at some of these strategies in detail. Motivation is clearly very important. And how do you get an athlete motivated? The most important things are goals, the goals that they set. The goals that they set will determine how much drive, how much effort, how much will they have to perform well. But often a goal of winning is not enough. Sometimes, or most times, it's important that an athlete has a number of sub-goals uh, which are related to their performance, so things like personal bests, that drive them both in training and uh, in competition. It's important that those goals conform to certain features, and scientists, psychologists, and practitioners always refer to this SMARTER acronym. And that's because having goals that are realistic, relevant, specific, measurable, and so forth, are really important when it comes to getting an athlete motivated. As I said earlier, motivation is not enough. It is important that an athlete is confident. And there are a number of ways you can boost an athlete's self-confidence. Experience, reminding an athlete of their experience is extremely important. Modeling, and I don't mean catwalk modeling here, modeling is also an important aspect because that enables an athlete uh, to have a model or a blueprint, if you like, of, of the optimal performance. Imagery and self-talk are part of that, and we'll get onto those in a moment. Feedback is clearly important as well. Positive feedback from the athlete's coaches. Imagery is a mental rehearsal, and it's a strategy that many athletes use. And here's the, the kinds of things that a, uh, an athlete or a coach will go through when they're rehearsing a performance. It's almost like a, a video of their performance. They will also use prompts, but they will also visualize any contingencies that arise. For example, any barriers or problems or difficulties that arise during the course uh, of their competition. Here's an example of these kinds of strategies in action. This is Blanka Vladic. She was a former world champion, a high jumper, and IAAF athlete of the year. And she was very famous for going through the same performance routine prior to a competition. She would close her eyes, visualize uh, a successful jump. She would clap her hands rhythmically uh, and use the audience, get the audience on board, and that would both m boost her motivation and her confidence. And then she would practice some moves shortly before executing her jump. Self-talk is another strategy that athletes use. It's an extremely important strategy because it enables athletes to go through in their mind and use mantras to try and boost their motivation, but also to try and manage the, the, the competition and the situation. For example, the, the, the situations where the pressure is on and they are highly anxious. So self-talk might have motivational components, but it also might help athletes focus on the important things that are relevant to performance, 
so-called cues, and it also might have a calming effect, um, things like breathe and relax. Anxiety management is an important aspect of sports performance. Clearly, at the Olympic Games, at World Championships, at the highest level, uh, athletes are going to be under pressure, and they need to be able to cope with that pressure. Sometimes being too anxious can actually undermine an athlete's performance. It can be suboptimal. So relaxation techniques are extremely important in this regard, and psychologists will work with athletes to try and help them to relax. So it might involve things like breathing, stretching, relaxing the muscles, but it'll also use things like music and meditation. Michael Phelps is a good example. He listens to music right up to the few minutes before his event. And that music will get him to the right frame of mind for that event. It'll help him to relax, but it'll also motivate him. Here's a good example of somebody using those techniques to the greatest extent. This is Yelena Isambieva, a double Olympic champion at the pole vault uh, and also the world record holder. This is her at the 2012 Olympics. She's clearly very relaxed. She, she, she lies back, she covers herself in her clothes. This has the effect of shutting out uh, any distractions, but it also has the effect of relaxing her and uh, relieving the pressure. So, in terms of the mind of a winner, from a sports psychology perspective, an athlete has to be motivated, confident in their abilities, manage pressure extremely well, and use these well-drilled techniques like imagery, self-talk, and relaxation. Thank you.